Diabetes is one of the fastest growing health challenges of the 21st century. Adults living with diabetes have more than tripled in the past 20 years. So instead of depending on pills or insulin, could a change in diet be key to preventing or even reversing diabetes? The experts weigh in. The Morning Medical Update starts now. Good morning, everyone. Glad you're with us. It is Tuesday, May 3rd. Thanks for joining us here on Facebook, YouTube, and on Twitter. Coming up here in just a bit, Dr. Dana Hawkinson joins us with the COVID-19 numbers and the latest COVID headlines. Diabetes is a major cause of blindness, kidney failure, heart attacks, stroke, and lower limb amputation. Can a simple diet change help put it into remission. Our experts talk about the new treatments. But first, the CDC has issued an alert for parents to watch out for hepatitis in children. What is likely the cause as more and more kids are getting it? Get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, and email us at the Medical News Network. You can find links to those right there on your screen. More than 200 children across the world have what's called acute hepatitis. Here in the U.S., cases are now reported in 10 states, including Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Alabama, and New York. At least two children needed a liver transplant. Another child has died. Joining us now with the latest is Dr. Stephen Lauer, a pediatrician here at the health system. Good morning to you. Good morning. Well, this is really unusual. So tell us a little bit about what acute hepatitis is and, and what you are sure. noticing. What can you tell us and update us on? Well, he, acute hepatitis is, again, this has been around forever. It's an inflammation of the liver that in eventually in severe cases can lead to shutting down of the liver and the eventual need for, for transplant. Um, most of it gets better. You know, hepatitis with the right supports from the medical system will get better. Um, on its own, but this, these new cases are certainly concerning. So where did this come from? It just seemed like poof, it, it became a headline, and now you've got parents like myself concerned. Yeah. You don't think of hepatitis with children. Help us make the yeah. connection. Well, it is, it is fairly uncommon in kids. Uh, it can happen, and that's why we have vaccines against hepatitis A and, and B. But uh, this seems to be a type of hepatitis not caused by the typical hepatitis viruses. Uh, they're still trying to figure out exactly what the cause is uh, may be related to an adenovirus infection, but uh, it's a lot of work going on around the world to try and understand where this is coming from and how to go about treating it. So where does adenovirus come from and does it spread among kids? Well, adenovirus is here all the time. Okay. It's been around, there's, there's 50 types of it and it's one of the major causes of viral upper respiratory infections that we see commonly. It's just usually not as severe as the, these hepatitis cases. Most of the time, again, viral uh, upper respiratory symptoms and a few times turning into a gastroenteritis with some vi uh, vomiting and diarrhea, but the hepatitis part is new. But you said that that's been around a while, but it, oh, again, yeah. it, it, it's when things like this happen or these, these news flashes come up that we go, oh, we had no idea. We hadn't heard of that before. So. Has lowered immunity due to COVID and the pandemic had anything to do with this? Um, I, I really, I mean, I know that's being discussed. I really think this sounds much more like a new version of a virus, kind of like the you know, coronavirus leading to COVID. Some change may have happened in, a, in one of these adenoviruses as it passes among humans and switched to something that's more of a problem in causing a hepatitis. So unlikely that it's only due to this lack of exposure to it. Um, we've been seeing kids with adenovirus throughout the pandemic, so this is, seems to be something new. So if, if my child has hepatitis, I have no clue, what Correct. kind of symptoms am I looking for? Well, first off, we make clear this is still very rare. I mean, there's 200 cases in the world. Got so it. this is, it's not uh, on every street corner. This is- This is not COVID. This is not COVID, but what we're looking for is something different than the normal just vomiting and diarrhea, which certainly any parent right now knows there's been a lot of that around as schools and daycares have opened back up. This is, we're talking about children who are really sick, vomiting that can't stop, not eating, not, uh, not doing anything. And then as their livers start to become more uh, affected, they get jaundice as they get a little yellow color in their skin. Very rare, but why would something like this, and, and maybe that's why you bring in Dr. Hawkins to yeah. talk about infectious diseases in general, but when something just kind of sprouts up like that, how do you, can you explain that Dr. Hawkinson, why, when a, um, you know, an infectious disease or anything like this just kind of mm -hmm. comes out of nowhere, even though yeah. it may be rare? 
I think there's a lot of things to that answer. You know, first of all, what, you know, there was a question of is immunity worse because we're all wearing masks and we're getting infected. I don't think that's the case. I think what multiple studies have shown was that really the mask just delayed these things. Um, and then in addition to that, you probably have a higher concentration now occurring in a shorter period of time. In addition, is this just a case of better recognition of these things? And really, what is the true um, cause of this? Is it the adenovirus? We know that some of those cases had coronavirus as well. So I think it's a bunch of, of different things and different issues going on there for detection and management of all these, um, of, of when this does happen, um, to answer your question. So. Age group, who who is it? Why the young ones? Um, well, that's one of the questions they're trying to find out. Um, again, if it is related to adenovirus, it's a common infection among children. You tend to get immunity as you get older. Um, but trying to sort out why it's in children, uh, the age range is uh, babies up to 16 year olds uh, have been affected by it. Oh, does so far tend to be in younger children, but basically anybody in the pediatric age group seems to be affected. So, again, rare. We're, we yeah. want to make sure we're using yeah, that rare. word quite a bit, rare. Yeah. But if, um, is there a way to protect yourself or protect your children from something like that? Well, it's going to go back to the same old answers that we've been given. It's, you know, wash your hands, cover your cough, stay away from sick people. This is, it's basic, the basics of uh, infection control uh, that would have been the same of how you avoided a normal adenovirus infection, if it is adenovirus or any other infection before the pandemic. So that's how it spreads? It's, yeah, adenovirus spreads by, usually by respiratory droplets. If it's uh, causing a gastroenteritis, vomiting and diarrhea can spread through those body secretions. But yeah, it's contaminated fluids. Okay, all right, we're gonna get to some community questions here and just. I think to Dr. Lauer's point too, that's very difficult for those aged children to, yes, to adhere is, to those, a, right. those guidance. Well, that was uh, my measures. question, does it spread fast the way that, yes. you know, the this way COVID did? We say 200 cases now, but it, does, it, does it spread fast if, in that small age group when we know that they're not always practicing the right correct. infection? Yes, prevention. it can definitely spread. It's, it's challenging to keep those kids from spreading uh, you know, say cover your cough and wash your hands, but that's how these things spread. All right, so I want to get to our COVID count. Dr. Dana Hawkins and joining us now with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have our numbers today? Yeah, so we have five active infections uh, in the hospital, uh, two in the ICU, one on the ventilator, nine in that recovery period, so a total of 14, but still very good as far as the active infections go. It's still in those single digits. Uh, again, despite cases continuing to be on the rise, uh, hospitalizations uh, in, in the country as a whole on the rise, although in some states they're up, some states are down. Uh, but again, we know that some other countries are seeing surge in cases as well. I think what we are all hoping based on vaccination, vaccination plus infection, people who have been infected uh, and especially reinfected, um, that we can all keep them out of the hospital with that built up immunity on an individual basis, but also at the community level as well. We got a question yesterday about our long haul clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, we know people are still suffering from long haul yeah. symptoms. Uh, okay, so mm -hmm. trying to uh, sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Mm. Um, there is a study out there that says that people who sing lullabies find it easier to breathe. Mm -hmm. Any word on that? Any truth behind that? You know, I know that, um, so first of all, long COVID is a significant problem. It is probably only going to get to be a worse problem. We are learning the mechanisms which cause it. We still don't know all of them. One of the things that can help though, and I think we need to continue to endorse this, is that vaccination soon after infection will help uh, either reduce the symptoms or reduce your risk of getting long COVID. Um, you know, that could be just a, one of the uh, teaching or coaching elements that is done, especially for people who have like autonomic dysfunction. We heard about that story when people are, are standing up and they get lightheaded or they're getting dizzy or their heart's beating. Uh, they have techniques to help improve that. This may be just one technique to help uh, improve and center yourself. Uh, you know, we know that brain function is linked to heart function. They are all uh, linked to each other and so doing that may just be one technique to help calm the system down um, but we know things like that are are, are taught uh, for helping to to reteach your body especially in those people with those 
autonomic types of dysfunction. Well, and we know that long COVID is such a mystery, so who knows? I mean, people are trying everything, so maybe that did yeah. work for someone. Yeah. Okay, South Africa's latest surge possible, a mm -hmm. preview to the pandemic's next, next chapter. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? You know, I think it's so hard to say. Um, every country is different. Um, different communities within those countries, different uh, populations in any specific area. We know that United States is, is different. We know that they identified Omicron, they've identified a B4, B5 variant. Um, so I think it's very difficult to say, and I think, um, you know, we do have now vaccination immunity. Um, we have those people that have been infected or reinfected who are still surviving, who probably have some immunity. Again, I think what we're looking at when we talk about this now is we've shifted from just cases to hospitalizations. But we know as cases increase, we have to expect some sort of level of hospitalization increase. Uh, so I, I think it is different. I think it's too early to say exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but we know the virus is out there circulating. It continues to circulate. We know that there is increasing rates of cases and hospitalizations around the United States. We have to see uh, what that brings. But I think the most important part is these vaccines continue to be effective against all these variants and reducing your risk of hospitalization, severe disease and death if you are up to date with your vaccination. And so that is what we have to continue to endorse because what we really want is for you or your loved ones to stay out of the hospital, stay out of the ICU. The other thing that we have now, we have a probably abundant supply, mostly around the nation, I would expect, are those antiviral drugs. And right now, Paxlovid is a tier one or a preferred uh, uh, item to use as an outpatient. Paxlovid is the oral pill. Uh, the other preferred agent is that IV remdesivir. It's a little bit more difficult to get, but I think around the nation, our supply of Paxlovid is much better now. So taking Paxlovid, uh, being vaccinated, all those things will help reduce your chance of coming to the hospital. And that's really what we're looking for. Tanya wants to know, could hepatitis be the sequel to the coronavirus infection? And your thoughts, and then I wanna ask uh, Dr. Lauer as well. Yeah, I, I think that's difficult to say. I think, are, are we talking about the hepatitis that we are seeing now that is being identified in children? Um, I think that's difficult to say. I mean, we know, just as Dr. Lauer said, adenovirus, if this is the cause, this has certainly been implicated at this point in time. We know adenovirus has been around for a long time. We know we are always very concerned about adenovirus in our BMT population. Dr. McGurk and his colleagues, we test for that uh, when, when, when the need arises. Um, I don't expect that to be anything like what is going on with the pandemic with SARS-CoV-2 at this point, though. And again, what is the true uh, impact of this hepatitis in this possible adenovirus link? Is it just because we're looking better, we're identifying it easier now? Um, so I think there's a lot of differences and discrepancies between the two. Dr. Lauer, far-fetched yeah. or? Um, I think it's, I think everything has to be explored right now, but yeah, this seems most likely to be some new agent. I think it just points out that there's thousands at least of viruses out there. They keep changing and we have to keep close surveillance of what they're doing and what kind of diseases are causing. All right. Well, more than 293,000 people in the metro are affected by diabetes. And of those, nearly 70,000 don't even know they have it. According to the World Health Organization, diabetes is among the leading causes of kidney failure and can triple your risk of stroke or heart attack. Joining us now at the table um, to talk about diabetes and some recent fad diets is Dr. David Robbins, an endocrinologist who heads the Cray Diabetes Self-Management Center here at the health system. Good morning to you, doctor. How are you? I'm good, good morning. Well, always good to have you on. Dr. Robbins, more than 37 million Americans have diabetes. That's according to the CDC. Uh, 96 million more have prediabetes. Uh, we know obesity is one of those factors. What are some other factors and what do you make of those, those numbers? Well, the other two important factors are age and genetics. And unfortunately, you can't do anything about getting older and you can't change your genetics. Mm -hmm. But there are environmental factors that we do have some, uh, some ability to affect. Well, two decades ago, if you asked a diabetes specialist to explain the cause of type 2 diabetes, uh, doctor, they would say that it was insulin resistance. Is that still the case? It's, it's a little difficult to explain, but insulin resistance is always associated with insulin deficiency. In other words, uh, your body is not making enough insulin to overcome the resistance. And it's at that breaking point that the blood sugar goes up and you become diabetic. 
So did the pandemic play a big role in any of these numbers that we're seeing, or do you think there may be a, an after effect? Yeah, we think we, we think it did. We're seeing an increase in the incidence. There's new cases of both type one and type two, the insulin dependent and non-insulin dependent diabetes. It's unclear if the virus did that itself, or is it simply the illness that brought out the previous uh, risk for diabetes? Dr. Lauer, childhood diabetes, what, what did the pandemic have any effect on, on people bringing in their children or, or getting to that quicker that you noticed? Or, well, or are we still waiting to find out? Uh, there'll be a lot more to come on it, but the concern is that with the uh, not seeking care as much over two years and especially the lack of activity, yeah sitting around the house, just more and more eating, and, and the part of it that is due to weighing too much, having too much weight on your, your frame, that we're seeing uh, has increased, and so concerns that down the line that will lead to increases in diabetes. Just compiled onto the problem. Yep. So, Dr. Robbins, we know that insulin pills help, um, but so does a good diet. A recent uh, article published in the Daily Mail says that there's a new game-changing diet that can reverse uh, diabetes through a dramatic weight loss or a drastic 800 calorie a day diet. That sounds really drastic. Tell us if this is truly a diet that would work or even be healthy for someone. Talk well, us through that. It's the diet du jour. Right. Uh, this, this is a story that's been going on for years. Uh, when I, if a patient asks me to make it as simple as possible, what can I do in terms of reversing my diabetes for the type two, the, the pe people that are usually obese, I say lose weight. Mm -hmm. Any diet that's hypocaloric is going to cause a marked improvement in the glucose, the blood pressure, and the lipids. So I don't particularly care if it's high protein, low protein, um, high carb or low carb, but if you're spending more energy than you take in as food, your diabetes usually gets better. So just do the math yep. on those calories and yep. the activity. Yep. What about um, reversing type 1 or through diet helping type 1 diabetes? So uh, we don't, diet it does not reverse type 1 because by and large the damage that's done to the pancreas through the immune system has been irreversible. Uh, diet is important in controlling the blood sugar uh, so that insulin will work properly. Having said that, we've just had a drug approved by the Food and Drug Administration that seems to attack the immune system and slow the development of type 1. Uh, we also have a company in California that has produced stem cells that act like insulin producing cells and we at least have one individual now who has been insulin free for several months after getting these cells. So we're on the cusp, I think, of seeing, of seeing some of the things that may end up being the cure or prevention. Dr. Lauer, I have to bring you in here. You know, I, like I see you in the hallway and I'm always like, how do I get my kids to eat better? So let's, I'm gonna bring you in because that's what we're trying to do is help kids so they don't, they don't come and they're not having to be on pills long-term and they're not developing type two diabetes. What are the conversations you're having with parents and what is some of your best advice? Well, it's very, one of the uh, answers or results of many studies in the adult world, especially is that changing how people eat is extraordinarily difficult. So while there's all these diets out there, things you can do, that's after the fact. What we're trying to get to with parents is good healthy eating habits right from the beginning as kids start eating at that six month visit. How do you really introduce the whole idea of healthy foods, healthy diets uh, from the beginning so we don't have to be doing this catch up work um, in the adult world and trying to fix damage that's already occurred. And I always tell you that it's not easy. You need to move in. <laughs> no, it is you not. need to move in with us because it is not an easy it, thing to do. But you're right. But trying to do it later is it twice as hard. Twice as hard. And it's it's just the everyday thing right from the beginning. And again, one thing we've talked about the whole worry about my kid isn't eating enough. They'll eat enough. They're you know, they 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 won't uh, starve themselves. So good healthy food on regular schedules and then working with them to help them make those smart choices when they're young so that when they're 20, 30, and 40 years old, they continue to make those smart diet choices. I've listened to your advice because I always said, oh, you missed a meal or you fell asleep before dinner last night, so you missed your meal last night, so now you gotta eat more today. And so stop worrying about missing meals. They're not, nothing's gonna happen. They're, it's the kind of meals they're having when they do make it to the table, right? They're, they're, they're pretty smart. They will not starve themselves. If, they, if they're not hungry, they're not hungry. And one of the biggest problems we have, I think, overall is people eating, getting used to the idea they should eat when they're not hungry. Mm. That's, you know, it's one of these core things we have to get around is like you eat when you're hungry, when your body is saying it needs calories. 
um, and not, as Dr. Robin says, just overdoing it and taking in too many. Well, and you and I talked the other day. It was I, I can't, I can't make you eat, but I can certainly control what you do eat if it's That's bad stuff. Right. You know, my kids don't make yes. out my grocery list. I do, that, right? So that I got to take, true. I got to take the responsibility. All right, Dr. Robbins. Another study: controlling blood sugar may improve response to exercise training. Familiar with that? Yeah. Um, so it, it really is a fundamental part of type two diabetes to exercise. And and having said that. When, when I say exercise, people think, oh, he's talking about running a marathon. In fact, low-level exercise, walking upstairs, uh, housekeeping, uh, parking your car at the farthest part of the parking lot, uh, improves insulin sensitivity and lowers the blood sugar. Um, conversely, there are uh, diabetic patients who perform in marathons, uh, triathlons, and um, they very carefully control their diets so that they have a balance between how much sugar they're using in their muscles and how much sugar is available. And so we like to talk about that because there really are very few limits to what a person with diabetes can do if they get the right tools and they're so motivated to do it. Uh, any new treatments, anything on the horizon that we should know about, some hope in the future? Uh, yeah, uh, we have some exciting new drugs coming out in diabetes that are really mechanistically new. Um, and, and the holy grail of diabetes has been to have a drug that both causes weight loss and improves the blood sugar and lowers the risk of cardiovascular disease. We have some of those now which are less potent than we would like, but we have some that are very close to final development and approval by the Food and Drug Administration. That patients are losing between 20 and 40 pounds a year and having dramatic drops in the blood sugar. So they really seem to be uh, doing what we would like them to do. I want to get to some community questions because we've got a few good ones here this morning. Joe Ellen wants to know, with regard to age, genetics, and diet, how would you rate each out of 100? For instance, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so work the numbers. So like if you, if, is it 50, 25, 25? Just wondering what your well, take is on those three let factors. Let me tell you a little bit about um, uh, the, the Pima Indians in Arizona. Uh, in 1955, uh, Elliot Joslin visited the Pima Indian Reservation, and of the 10,000 Pimas, he found five who were diabetic. If you go there now in 2022, 70 to 80 percent of the Pimas are diabetic and 90 percent are obese, and their genetics has not changed. Mm -hmm. So this is a dramatic, uh, uh, it's a dramatic demonstration of the effect of environment. Uh, pickup trucks, uh, gaming, they, the tribes have become fairly wealthy, they eat poorly, uh, mechanization. Uh, and uh, it, it, to me, it's a canary in the cage. Uh, it's not just the Pima Indians, but our entire population that's going through this change where we, we, we don't have the, the exercise in our normal routine, we have excess calories, um, and we're all susceptible to this. Uh, Sarah wants to know, what is the connection between diabetes and children post-COVID? Is this limited to unvaccinated children uh, and symptomatic children, or do vaccinated and or asymptomatic children, um, are they getting diabetes post-COVID? Can uh, both docs weigh in on what you, what you know, Dr. Robinson? Well, I don't think we know okay. if the vaccination will uh, reduce. The, the numbers are, are not small enough to draw a conclusion yet. I would still uh, lay uh, strength on the on the concept that you should get vaccinated, and I and I think that there's there's no reason not to. That's the same uh, message you've always yeah, given. Sounds familiar. Yeah, I think this. There, while there may be something that comes out of a long term look and years from now, seeing if there was increases in di diabetes rates among those who had COVID or not, the the one that we're really concerned about is more those environmental changes, those diet changes that have happened during the pandemic, where there's there's just more calories in less activity and so the shift toward more weight uh, that's happened among uh, the pediatric population. Jen wants to know, Dr. Lauer, if uh, you're seeing or treating post-COVID pediatric patients, are you mm -hmm. hearing from parents? Mm -hmm. What type of um, post-symptoms are they experiencing? There's, yes, there are some patients uh, that we're seeing who just, they continue with a wide variety of things like Dr. Hawkins referred to, some of the, the dysautonomic symptoms where they're dizzier, they're more fatigued, um, maybe some heart rate changes. It's, uh, it's not very specific, but it can be in some cases, uh, as in the adult world, quite debilitating. 
um, and just slows them down. They're just not back to where they should be. Um, they're not, in many cases, sick the way we think, you know, you can't do blood tests on them. There's not something that stands out, but they have not recovered and they're not back to being able to do everything that they were before they got COVID. Does it feel like a mystery to you? It's um, just like you're treating a new, a um, new ailment. Well, I think actually this is something that's con that has been around in some version or another for a long time. There's been a lot of, you know, uh, different syndromes after other viruses where people just very or thought of as kind of vague symptoms, not very specific, but they're definitely not able to do what they did before. They're tired, they can't do things, and that seems to We just to have a name for it now because of COVID. It, you're saying we have long COVID, but you're saying that there have been long haul symptoms to yes, other things. Correct. Makes yes, sense. this is something that comes up after many viral infections. All right, Dr. Hawkinson, I got a couple questions for you. Isaac wants to know, any thoughts from Hawkeye on the relapse cases mm -hmm. after taking Paxlovid? Mm -hmm. Should people be masking and staying home on Paxlovid? Um, you know, I think you still, regardless if you're on Paxlovid or not, I think you still have to adhere to the guidance of being home, isolating for those five days, and then you can go out with the mask for the other five days for, for that total of 10 days. So I don't think taking Paxlovid affects the isolation guidance that I'm aware of. What about the relapses? Um, I think we are still looking into it. We do understand that there were some cases of relapses during the trials as well, uh, but I don't think we have enough information or uh, what I've seen enough published information to be able to otherwise speak on that. Um, so there's two different kind of questions there. Um, number one, I think we are still waiting for more information about the relapse of cases. Um, we know that there were some in the trials. And the other issue is I don't think taking Paxlovid um, changes the guidance for isolating and masking once your isolation is done after infection. Last questions from Lisa. Just got over COVID. I was going to get my second booster before I got it. Mm -hmm. Now I'm wondering when I should get that second booster. Should I wait for a few weeks? Yeah. You know, I think there's not really any formal recommendation. I think, uh, you know, waiting six or eight weeks is reasonable um, to do that because now you have had some sort of natural immune boost. Uh, with the infection, you know, you probably, if it was recent, you probably have BA2, so you have some uh, immunity to that. Uh, but there's no formal recommendation. You know, if you wanted to wait probably 60 days, eight weeks-ish, um, I think that that would be a, a reasonable time to wait. Um, I think that's important to understand because we know that has happened to a lot of people. Um, right now, there is no other formal guidance. Uh, but I think you, you are protected now for a little bit. You've had some natural immune boost, and I think waiting for a, a couple months is reasonable. All right, um, I'm gonna get to final thoughts with Dr. Hawkins, and I have to say you have a big fan. Yeah, I found your number one fan uh -oh, online this morning, Cami. Oh. <laughs> so she just she wrote a very very long, lovely message about you, and uh, she was actually up here as a visitor the other day, and she thought she saw you, oh, and she didn't know yeah. if she should just run up to you and like yeah, greet you as her new best friend. But <laughs> she's been watching all along, and she said she kind of sits in silence. But she said thank you for all you do. I just yeah, wanted to pass that along well, to you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm always roaming the halls, uh, doing my other job of, of treating patients. Yes, you are, patients. and it is okay to come up to you and say hi, friends, That's right? right? Okay, yes. good. All right, Dr. Robbins, thanks so much. It's always good to hear from you, see you, and uh, great to have you on. Uh, final you. thoughts from you. Well, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist, and um, one of the things that, that patients with diabetes with type 2, the adult form of diabetes, don't sometimes understand is that it's both usually preventable, and in many cases it's reversible. But the longer you wait, the less your chances of getting rid of it. So if you, if you go in, they tell you you have diabetes, it's not time to despair. It's time to put the pedal to the metal, mm -hmm. to get into an exercise program, get into a weight loss program, and understand that there's a high likelihood that if your diabetes doesn't go away, it's going to get much better and you're going to be at less risk for complications. I love that positive message. You know, be your own health advocate, pedal to the metal, get after it. Take care of yourself. Dr. Lauer, final thoughts? Well, on that one, I'd say the, the best way to avoid any chronic disease is to never get it. And so the, again, for parents really now coming out of this, hopefully coming out of the pandemic, back to those really healthy eating habits, getting, used, getting your child used to good healthy food choices early on so that down the line they don't have to see Dr. Robbins. That's right, good to see you, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Hawkins, and final thoughts from you today. Yeah, again, uh, I think it still goes back to um, vaccination, continuing to uh, 
get those boosters if you're up to date. We had a good question about vaccination after infection. Uh, you know, looking back now, it, you know, you can certainly wait. Um, I said eight weeks, two months. Certainly the CDC would say uh, possibly even wait three months or uh, even possibly wait till the fall. So again, it is um, some, some gray area there. Uh, just kind of continue to, to stay with us. But if you wanted to wait for that eight to 12 weeks before getting that booster, and by that time, we're almost gonna be into the fall, it may be a reasonable time to get it anyhow. So I think that would be uh, good to, to understand. And of course, now we're gonna have a lot of probably increased cases. Um, so we'll see how that affects the population as a whole. I love this hospital. My phone was ringing and it was the health system. It's your office telling me that I'm overdue. I got to get my kids in to see you. Right. <laughs> They're all over it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Over. They can't wait to see you. All right. I will be calling the back after the show. I promise. Well, May marks testicular cancer awareness month. About one in 250 men will develop it in their lifetime. Although it's somewhat rare and usually successfully treated, urologist Dr. Jeff Holzberline is passionate about helping men avoid it if possible and shares the top three things he wants men to know. The first thing we'd like men to know about testicular health is that we want them to feel comfortable and know how to do a self-testicular examination. We feel like it's critical to teach young men how to do that, just like we teach young women how to do a breast exam. The identification of an abnormality in the testicle early on um, is really critical towards uh, having a diagnosis and early detection. So the earliest warning sign of testicular cancer would be the identification of a mass in the testicle. The vast majority of those masses that are detected are actually not tender. So it's a little bit confusing to many men because they think if there's no pain associated with it that there might not be anything wrong. But we want to make sure that uh, young men know that even if there's no pain associated, but they notice that their testicles enlarging or has a mass in it, they should seek medical attention. As far as testicular screening goes, it really is important that all men between the ages of 18 to 40, when they see their physician, should be having a testicular examination by their physician. The second thing we'd like men to know is not to be embarrassed about it, to make sure that they feel comfortable talking with their either physician or their medical professional so that if they do identify something that's abnormal about their testicle, uh, they can get that uh, seen quickly. So I think the way that we break the stigma, um, like so many things, is early education, right? Is making sure that at a young age, uh, men are taught that, it, you know, first of all, self-testicular examination and not to be embarrassed about it. And uh, I think a public awareness about that as well is very useful. We've done a great job with that in uh, women's health and in breast health in particular. Um, but we need to do the same thing in men's health. The third thing I'd like uh, people to know is that testicular cancer is one of the true success stories of medicine. It is one of the most highly curable cancers that we treat. Uh, across all stages, the cure rate is over 98%. So even if you are diagnosed with testicular cancer, you should know that your chances of being cured are extremely good. Great reminder and great message. Thanks for being with us today. Don't forget you can always catch our shows anytime on Facebook, YouTube, and on Twitter. Everyone, have a great Tuesday. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Cystic fibrosis is the most common life-limiting fatal genetic disorder. Join Dr. Steve Stites this Wednesday as we show you the science behind the leading CF drug, Trikafta, and share news of a new trial investigating gene therapy. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.